as I am speaking these words, I see the healing hands of the Lord stretch out to touch and heal the broken hearts. Amen. He is doing that work for you today. So be of good cheer. So God wants to abide in our midst. And we must know what He wants to do. What He wants us to do. We must humble ourselves to seek His face and His ways. What are your ways, God? You know, stop running around and to this pastor or to that pastor, to this person, this minister or that minister asking for a word. Stop doing that. If you don't stop that, forever you are an adopted child. Only adopted child run here and there. If you are a child of the family, the father can talk to you directly, right? The father can talk to you. Even if the father is upset with you, he will still talk with you. Am I right? You know, when I got saved, my father was very, very upset with me. He was so upset, he was so angry, he was so disappointed. He never spoke with me for five years. He totally excommunicated. However, he still wants me to do work for him. <laughs> so how to communicate? He will use my mother. Tell him to, <laughs> tell him to do this, tell him to do that. So I will tell her, ask him to talk to me directly. If he wants me to go and get him a packet of cigarettes, ask him to come and talk to me directly. So he won't talk to me directly, no? But over the years, when he got finally safe, then he started talking to me. So you are a child of God. You know, again and again, the word that keeps on coming before me is hope to the hopeless. Today God will give you that. Hope to the hopeless. Especially there are people here who are very, very discouraged. Very, very discouraged. Even while you are hearing these words, a prophetic word will come to you and it will be dropped in your spirit and that would be like a rhema word for you, even if when you are hearing this word. And like, remember, earlier when I was praying, I said I saw an angel who walked into this church, and that angel is that healing angel who has been sent by God to bind up the broken hearts. So he is here. I even see him standing in our midst right now to do the healing work in your heart. Whatever it is, you are not going to leave this place empty-handed. You don't need any physical hands to be laid on you. The Lord Himself is here to bless you. Amen. Now look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at His life, in John chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, He always says, Whatever I see the Father doing, that I do. Whatever I see Him doing, I only do that. Because He said, I and the Father are one. And God, which means God is inside Him. In Him, walking in Him. If He's in Him, then the flesh must remain silent. If the flesh remains silent by you, not doing things your own way, but seeking the face of God, seeking what He wants you to do, how He wants you to do, what He wants you to do. His flesh was always quiet. Now if you look at Luke chapter 22, 39 to 44, please turn with me to Luke 22. There you'll find that at the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus Christ was praying a prayer that we all know too well how before he was to be crucified he prayed in this prayer offering himself we know this too well where he said if it be possible remove this cup from me 
if you look at verse 42 he prays that prayer and elsewhere in the gospel of matthew and mark it says that he prayed that prayer three times and here you find that on the third time when he prayed this prayer father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done so when he prayed this prayer verse 43 says an angel appeared from heaven and strengthened him now period we all have heard it been preached i myself have preached it that an angel was sent to strengthen the lord for him to face the cross amen you know all my life for 35 years i was preaching like that until this morning when an angel came and asked me a question he said look at this passage very clearly if the angel had already strengthened the lord then why does it say he prayed more earnestly after that verse 44 says he prayed more earnestly the angel already strengthened him to face the cross so if the work is already done why pray more earnestly i never never understood it until this morning you know the angel came to strengthen him to offer himself to die to his flesh because the flesh was standing in the way That's right he knows he was called to die but yet there in gethsemane you see him in all his humanity and just like how we struggle when god calls us to sacrifice something it doesn't come easy right we try to put fleeces up before the lord lord give me one confirmation god give me two confirmation then when god gives you two confirmation not enough one god one give me three, three confirmation you know why we ask for all that so that to confuse god So that God will get tired of giving you so many confirmation. He said, all right, go and do whatever you like to do. <laughs> if you are a child of God, you know, whenever my mother tells me anything or when my father asks me to do something for him, I never ever go and say, can you give me second confirmation? <laughs> Have you? Or if your spouses call you and say, honey, can you do this or do that? Have you put down the phone and call her back say, can you reconfirm that one more time? <laughs> you see, we laugh at this idiocity, but don't we do that in our relationship with God? You know why we do that? Because we don't have a good relationship with God. We are not a sheep. We are a goat. Because the Lord Jesus said, my sheep hears my voice. If you are a sheep, you hear his voice. Goats don't hear, you know. You know, during my many years of ministry in Tibet, I have seen these shepherds they take out their flock in large numbers in the grass, huge grassland of Tibet. Hundreds, two hundreds, three hundreds, four hundred. And they don't go single shepherd, no, they go in pairs. Two or three shepherds together, they take out their flock, they go out. And all their sheep, six hundred, five hundred of them are all mingled together. And from morning till evening, they all are eating the grasses together. And these shepherds will sit under a shade and they'll take, talk stories, they'll drink tea and all that. And I used to wonder, all the sheep look alike. You know, how will they know? How will the shepherd know which sheep belongs to him? So, out of curiosity, I spent one whole day sitting there with the shepherd <laughs> just to see <laughs> how they will eventually separate the sheep, you know. So, just before daybreak now 
the shepherd calls out the sheep by name. Now, since those Tibetans, they use Tibetan name, no? So for the sake of you people, I'll let me use a Chinese name. <laughs> Akao! <laughs> as soon as he calls Akao, Akao stands up. <laughs> Meilan! And Meilan stands up. I was very surprised, you know. Akao, he calls. And that one particular Akao step, lifts up his head and will look around at the very direction where the shepherd was. And when the shepherd starts walking, all the sheep of that particular shepherd, they just separate themselves and follow their shepherd. Each of the three shepherds walking in three different directions, the collective sheep just separate themselves and follow their own respective shepherds. They have no problem of identifying or having a shepherd problem. <laughs> I was very surprised, you know. Then when I read the scripture, I understood my sheep knows my voice. So if you are a sheep, you will know the voice of your shepherd. And when you know the voice of a shepherd, what need is there for second confirmation? <laughs> right? What need is there for third confirmation or fourth confirmation or seventh confirmation? You don't need. Once a woman from Australia called me for prayer. She was having some serious problem. She spoke to me for two hours on the phone. And after hearing all her story, <laughs> you know I'm not a pastor, you know. So I have very little patience to listening to all the woes of people. Whenever people come and tell me anything, before they go more than a minute, I'll say, all right, let's pray now. <laughs> let's kneel down and we pray. That's what I do. I'm sorry, I'm not a pastor, no? But when we kneel down and pray, I'll get an answer from God for you. That's my cup of tea, you know? Not in counseling. We'll go straight to the counselor and get the answer from the counsellor. Anyway, so this lady went on and went on on and on and on and then finally I told her, okay, what is it that you want? <laughs> because nothing made sense to me, you know. Then she said, you know, God has already spoken to me seven times. Seven confirmations. So you are number eight. <laughs> Can you please pray now and get me a confirmation from God? So I looked at her and I said, My dear sister, whether eight, nine, or ten, or eleven, or twelve, you will never, never hear from God. When God has spoken once, He has spoken twice. You never obey. He was so kind to speak to you seven times. <laughs> which he need not do. But he did out of his great love for you. And all these seven people do not know each other. And they all give the same answers. And yet you don't want to listen. Why are you wasting my time? You know, you just wasted two hours of international direct calling time. It's a waste. And I refused to pray for her. I said, you don't need. Go and do what God has already spoken to you those seven times. I never, never in my ministry spoon feed people. I lead people to God. That's my job. A, a prophet's job is to lead you to God, not to me. You know, there was another lady she is uh, in the million dollar club of, in the insurance, from AIA insurance. Even when she has the smallest headache, she'll call me for prayer. I said, this, this is little prayer, you know, this small headache, just take Panadol, is enough. <laughs> Why need prayer? 
she she won't even take the panadol even when she has panadol she said no 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 you pray i said but you yourself can pray yeah but your prayer is more powerful than my prayer she says anyway i put up with all her this thing you know so one day she called me at 12:30 in the afternoon she said i am driving my car and talking to you at the same time i need you i need to make a very important decision and i need you to pray and get an answer from god right now whether i should close this deal or not so i said the sister it cannot be done like that you know don't worry you slowly need to wait on god and then get an answer she said but you don't understand of course i never understand you know <laughs> she said you don't understand i have no time so the when she said i have no time i looked at her and i said since you have no time why do you bother to seek god's will go and do whatever you want to do she jam on her brakes pull over on the road side i got her attention she said what do you want me to do i said cancel your appointment cancel your meeting go back home what you know how many million yeah it doesn't matter to me how many millions it is to you it is important to me it is not important if you want god's word do as i say she has some god fearingness inside her you know so she cancelled the multi million dollar meeting with a very 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 rich guy from indonesia and she cancelled the appointment so when she reached home i told her when you reach home you call me so she called me what shall i do now have a good dinner with your family eat well after eating well have a good family prayer time after that put your husband everybody to sleep but you don't go to sleep <laughs> you kneel down and you discuss this business proposal with the lord and then keep quiet and god will speak to you she asked me how will i know god will speak to me he will speak to you i guarantee you that really really <laughs> <laughs> so early the next morning she called me she said i've heard from the lord this is the answer i got from the lord is it correct or not I told her that is a right answer and I could have told you this yesterday afternoon at 1:00 o'clock. Ayyo. <laughs> If you had told me I could have gone to the meeting ma. <laughs> I told her if I had told you this answer yesterday afternoon you would not have learned how to wait on god forever you will rely on me which is wrong i will then become a god in your life and an idol in your life and then god will kill me <laughs> after that day onwards she never called me again because she has learned to talk to her god directly hallelujah amen, amen. amen. this is what you need to do you are not an adopted child you are a child of your father you are a child of your father you have a right to talk to your father you have a right to hear your father's voice you have the right to see your father's face and your father can talk to you directly what you need to do is to become like a lamb like a sheep that's how you must be transformed you must change your heart to be a sheep rather than a goat you know what is the characteristics of a goat it is very very stubborn it runs around all over the mountains in tibet i have seen that you know 
the goats are good for that they run here they run there one moment they are down on the road next moment they are up on the mountain they run everywhere the goat doesn't obey the shepherd and the goat always goes before the shepherd what else the sheep is very very timid very gentle very mild mannered meek full obedient and a follower it always follows the shepherd they are very very timid they are not bold like the goat they are very timid very meek full and they are followers they follow the shepherd wherever he goes even if the shepherd jumps into the ditch they'll all jump into the ditch <laughs> don't laugh you know why they do that because they trust the shepherd implicitly implicit obedience implicit trust that the shepherd will not lead them into wrong path that is the absolute trust the sheep has on the shepherd whereas the goat doesn't trust the shepherd he runs everywhere on its own so you need to change your heart to be a sheep that has an absolute trust in the living god he who call you is faithful he will never leave you nor forsake you he calls you he will take care of you all your provisions even your family he will provide for you he will take care of you if he calls you you are his you know when the lord called me into full time ministry i used to feel very guilty in my heart because in the indian tradition the older son is supposed to care for the parents and this our pastor was a very little boy at that time so <laughs> and two of my sisters were already married and uh, so my father mother and this little brother and i felt very guilty that i have forsaken my family <laughs> and gone into full time ministry so for a long time that guilt was very strong in my heart i used to feel very guilty and the devil used to compound on that guilty feeling so one day i was regretting and praying about this said, lord please forgive me for neglecting my family please as i was praying the lord appeared to me and he said it was i who called you not you who came on your own you take care of my work and i will take care of your family Amen. this was the covenant the lord made with me in january 1984 he said you be faithful to take care of my work and i will take care of your family so from that day in 1984 till now 30 odd years have passed by and i'm sure you have heard of all the many many testimonies my mother may have shared simple mundane things you know and how god has marvelously answered her prayer because she she used to blackmail the lord <laughs> yeah this is one part she doesn't say now but i can she she blackmails god you know the first time it happened was a year later i went into full time ministry the washing machine that i bought for her on for mother's day broke down that was because of our pastor's fault <laughs> anyway the machine would not work so she tried to get the mechanic and he wanted to charge her for a huge amount of money and she didn't have the money so she knelt down and she prayed lord if i had my son he would have worked earned some money and bought me a new washing machine or even pay for the repairs but now i don't have him because you took him <laughs> so therefore you better make this work So saying that word she went and switched the 
machine on again, it started working. <laughs> so this is how she blackmails God. <laughs> but when she shares these testimonies with me, I remember this covenant promise the Lord made with me. You take care of my work. I will take care of your family. And all these years, God has been faithful to do that. And He will do that for you. There's nothing for you to worry. There's nothing too big that the Lord who called you, who took you out of your father's house and plant you in a strange place, nothing too big that He cannot do. If He has asked you to do something that in the natural seems impossible, that even the locals cannot do. You don't need to wonder how that can be done through you. He who called you is faithful. And He will accomplish His good purpose through you. Because He has promised that He will give this nation into your hands. He has called you to walk from the north to the south. Surely he will give the nation into your hands. And you know that very well. Surely that nation is given into your hands. You need not fear. Amen. Amen. The Lord in his temple. When you are in the temple, what should we do? Psalms 27 verse 4. He says, the Lord is in his temple. Enquire in his temple what does the word enquire means the word enquire in hebrew is baka b a q a r baka means to consider to admire or to seek out which means it's not the flesh that is seeking it's selfish things. When you come before God's house, put away the fleshy seeking. Put away all that. I need this, I need that. I need a child, I need this, I need that. You know, one day the Lord spoke to me. He said, among the many TV programs that you're doing, I want you to start a new program for the fetus in the mother's womb. So, I, it, it, it astounded me, you know. I said, Lord, please pardon me from asking. If you ask me to, you ask me to do programs for little children, little children can sit before a TV and watch a program. But how can the fetus in the mother's womb watch a TV program? Then the Lord told me, haven't you read what the scripture says? When Mary visited Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant, as soon as the baby in her womb heard the voice of Mary, it leapt and it jumped. And John the Baptist was filled in the Holy Spirit at that moment when he heard that voice. So the Lord said, it is true fetus cannot see, but they can hear. All you have to do is create a program and announce the pregnant woman, the mothers to come and sit before the TV sets and let them just watch and the fetus in their womb will hear your voice and I will speak to the fetus and as they hear your voice, they will be filled in the Holy Spirit like it happened in the days of John the Baptist. And we have been airing this program called Baton Yatsar. Betan Yasar comes from the Hebrew word means, O oh, fetus, hear. And from the very first program that we telecast, we had about six pregnant women, six months and above. We invite them into our studio audience, and then I'll be sharing the word. And during that time of prayer, we have seen the baby in the womb just jumping up and down. These were all caught on camera. And the mothers have testified to us they have never ever felt prior to coming to our studio 
the movement of their babies. They've never felt it. First time, they said, as you were praying, we felt an anointing fall on me and the baby starts jumping up and down. Just like how it happened in the book of Luke, you read about John the Baptist. We have documented this, all caught on camera. So, then we organized a meeting for all the pregnant women to pray for them and bless them, you know. As I was praying for the meeting, my heart was also very burdened by some of my staffs who could not uh, bear a child though they were married for many, many years. So I prayed very much for them. I said, Lord, this your dear daughters, eight years, still they have not conceived anything, Lord. Please bless their womb. So as I was praying, the Lord told me, you invite them, two particular of my staffs, one volunteer, one was a full-time staff, to the program, and we were going to give gifts to all the mothers. Say, ask them to give out these gifts. Say, Lord, but they're not pregnant. And the Lord showed me a scripture which says, the barren woman is called a mother. The Bible calls them a barren woman is also a mother. So I called those two girls. I said, now you all are going to give out those gifts at the end after I prayed for all of them. So as they were giving out the gifts, and then I went and laid my hands on all the mothers, I began to pray. And this one particular of our volunteer staff, she was married for four years, could not conceive at all. So I laid my hands on her and I said, this time next year, you will have a child in your hands. She was shocked. She said, thank you, uncle. She thought that was just a, a word of encouragement. So I said, it's not a word of encouragement. This time next year, you will have a baby in your hands. Two months later, she conceived. She conceived so happy. Now she's four months or five months pregnant. And by the time we have our next meeting this year, she will have a baby in her hands to be dedicated at the meeting. So, to consider, when you come before God, don't bring your fleshy needs. God sees you, no? He knows what your needs are. You don't have to open your mouth and say anything. When you come before His temple, seek His face. With all your heart, seek His face. Put your flesh quiet. Let all flesh... Your needs, silent. Seek His face with all your heart. Whatever needs you may have. Whatever. Whatever praise you've been praying unto God. He knows, you know, when is the right time to bless you. When is the right time to answer your prayer. He knows. Don't put your flesh. Let your flesh remain silent. Let it be quiet. When you come into the temple of God, in the church of God, seek His glory. Psalms 29 verse 9 tells us, inquire about His glory. You know, if you read Isaiah 6 1, it says, His skirt fill the temple. So what is the skirt? Is the length of His cloth that was so long, it covered the whole temple. Now what is that? Psalm 65 verse 6 says, His cloth is power. Psalms 93 verse 1 says, His cloth is majesty. Psalms 104 verse 1 says, His cloth is honor. So you put this together, the rope of the Lord Jesus is power, majesty and honor. So when he comes, power comes with him. When he comes, his majesty comes with him. When he comes, his honor comes with him. When he walks past by you, when his robes brush you, his honor is brushing on you. His majesty is brushing on you. His glory is brushing on you. His power is brushing on you, making that which is dead to become alive. Even that which is dead. 
it can cause it to become alive. Dead organ, dead ovules, dead whatever becomes alive. You know, four years ago, the Lord called our entire staff to go on a corporate 40 days fast. So everybody have to fast for the new things or for the new season that we were going to enter into. And the Lord told me, if any one of them is unwilling to fast, dismiss them. So I, I gave a corporate, I called for a corporate uh, meeting and I told this to everybody and about 10 of them said we cannot fast. And all the 10 of them were my key managers. I said, okay, leave. She said, you want us to leave? I said, yeah, leave. If go, one goes out, God will send seven, you know. So, all the 10 left. Among the 10 who were supposed to leave, one of them, my HR manager, he said, you know, actually I don't like to leave, but I cannot fuss because I'm on medication. I asked him, what is your problem? He said, I have very low sperm count. As a result, we cannot have children. And because of that, I'm taking these medicines to make me whole. So by birth, he has a problem in his organ. So I told him, you believe my words? He said, yes, I do believe your words. He said, don't worry. You just fast for 40 days. Don't touch your medicine. On the 40th day, go to the doctor and see. Everything will be all right in your body. He looked at me and said, read? He said, yes, really. So he was with us for 40 days. Fasted every day for 40 days. And on the 40th day, before he came to the office for prayer, he went to the hospital for a check. <laughs> and way and behold, everything has been recreated in his body. Amen. That which was dead became alive. Today he has two kids, which was an impossibility. Naturally, it was impossible for him because of medical science. But God causes the dead to become alive. Because when he comes, he comes with power. He comes with honor. He comes with majesty. Amen? And the Bible also tells us in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, the Lord will come suddenly. The Lord will come suddenly. When he comes suddenly, all flesh must keep quiet. Which means, put away your usual plan. When the Lord comes suddenly, He wants to do what He wants to do. If God is the God of our lives, you're not doing church for the sake of gathering people for Sunday, right? We have come to seek God's face. If you come to seek God's face, then we want to see Him and hear from Him. I first encountered this kind of experience, I think in the year 1997, I was preaching at a combined Chinese churches conference in Los Angeles. I think it was the second last day of the conference. I was introduced and I went up to speak. As I was closing my eyes to pray a prayer before I start preaching, the Lord Jesus came and told me, before you preach, I want to heal the sick first. So give an altar call and ask all those who are sick and need the healing to come to the front. Normally, I, I don't normally do that because my gifts operate more on mass prayer than on personal praying. I do personal, but it's very, very rare. On a very large, you know, mass crowd, I don't minister personally because it's very, very time consuming. So the Lord told me, you do this and you personally go down and lay your hands on all the sick people and I will come and put my hands on your hands and heal the sick. So when I gave an altar call, you know the Chinese people, they are always very, very hungry. Even though they are sick or they are not sick, they all came to the front. 
very, very dangerous to give such altar call among Chinese people. <laughs> so, about 300 of them, the entire church came to the front. I thought, not everybody is sick. So, my, I thought my interpreter has misinterpreted, you know. So, I said, repeat one more time. So, I asked everybody to go back. And we repeat one more time. And all 300 people came to the front. <laughs> All right, so I went down. I began to lay my hands on every one of them. And by the time I finished with that last person, about one and a half hours had passed by. So I went up to the pulpit, and the Lord Jesus looked at me. He smiled. He said, it's done. So I asked everybody to stand up. I said, Amen. Finish. <laughs> they were shocked. So the pastor looked at me and said, what about word? That's not necessary for a word. The Lord wanted to heal the sick today. It's done. What is the necessity for the preaching of the word? I'm not here to do business. I came here to minister. And the Lord ministered. Period. Say, but we still need to work, ma. <laughs> you see? This is our tradition, our way. Throw away your ways. When the Lord comes suddenly in His temple, when He comes suddenly, then we must be prepared for the emergency situation. What the Lord wants. Throw away all those mundane plans that we do. Throw away all those plans and be open and be willing to do what God wants to do. Not our everyday programs or our plans. Allow God to have His way in your life. The Lord is in His temple. All flesh, traders, must be silenced. If you read Matthew 21, 12, Mark 11, 15, Luke 19, 45, and John 2, 14, when the Lord Jesus entered in the temple, the first thing he did was get rid of all the money changes, the business people who, who have changed the church into a business enterprise. He first kicked every one of them out. Then he came and sat in the temple. He healed the sick and he taught the people. But before that, there was more business activity in the church. Doing, buying, selling, this, that, stock market, all this nonsenses that take place today in the churches. When you have too much of money, you end up investing the money in all the wrong places. Instead of investing them in the kingdom of God. The money that God gives you it's not for you to hoard up wealth for yourselves. It is for the extension of the kingdom of God. Why does God prosper you and make you rich? Is it so that you can from three-room flat go to four-room flat, four-room to five-room flat, five-room to executive flat, executive flat to mention it, mention it to lender property, lender property, no property. <laughs> After lender property, you have to buy an island, you know. That's why people move to Sentosa Cove. What is that? Greed. 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 Absolute greed. We need to die to this. The wealth that God gives you is not for you to hoard up for yourselves. It is for the poor. It is for the poor. The blind, the deaf, the dumb, the orphans, the fatherless, the destitutes, help them. When you help the poor, God blesses you many more. You are saving up riches for yourselves up in the kingdom of heaven. You know, many years ago, in 1991, I saw this thing become a reality before my eyes. You know, the scriptures in Matthew 6, 19 and 20 says, Lay up treasures for yourselves up in heaven. I 
was visiting the U.S. and I stayed with this American family who were also missionaries. So one day we were having lunch, or before we have lunch, the day before, their daughter-in-law visited them. And this American family, you know, most American families I've seen are really quite well-to-do, if not overly well-to-do. I've never ever seen in any American family where they have broken furniture, torn carpet, except in India, where we have torn this, torn that, tattered this, tattered that, all that are uh, everywhere, we don't want to throw anything. But this American family I saw torn, worn out carpet in their living room. So the daughter in law visited them said, and gave them $3,000 and said, Mother, please go and buy a nice good carpet and some nice furniture because a lot of pastors come to the house. We want the house to look nice. So the lady also agreed. So the following day, in that evening, we were planning to go out and they invited me to come along to the mall because I'm always locked up in the room praying all the time. They said, come out for some fresh air. So we were planning to go. That afternoon, as we were lunching, she received a phone call. It's their missionary friend from Romania. So the, the pastor called and they were talking and this lady asked a question. Pastor, you are going to put a roof for the orphanage. Have you done it? She said, no, we are praying for the funds. And she asked him, how much would it cost to put the roof? So he said, $3,000. I overheard all this conversation, you know. Oh, blah, 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 everything was over. She said, okay, let's pray that God will provide the funds. Period over, she came back, continued eating. As they were eating, there was silence. Suddenly, she looked up at her husband. She said, honey. Since nobody is visiting our home, do we really need carpet? So the husband looked at her and he said, Need you ask me this question? Send him that money. <laughs> so I was shocked, you know. I was an eyewitness to all this thing happening. The very next day, they wired $3,000 to Romania for some, so that some poor orphans can have a roof over their head. A few days later, I was praying and I was caught up to heaven. And in heaven, I was walking down a street and I saw many beautiful houses. And as I was walking, the Lord Jesus walked by my side. And he came, we came to one particular house. He said, take a look at this house. I looked at this house. It, has a, it was made in a very strange manner. I looked and I saw, instead of one brick upon another brick, there were precious stones, ruby, diamonds, topaz, emeralds, all kinds of runes stacked up and that made the wall of the house. I said, Lord, I'm very surprised to see in, the, in earth we don't make houses like that. We put <laughs> bricks one on top of another. And the Lord told me, you know what all this represents, this represents the sacrifices that you all make on this earth. They are translated as precious stones, as treasures there. Then he pointed a finger at one particular large ruby. He said, look at that. This represents the $3,000 that she sent to Romania for the orphanage. It was translated as a big, huge ruby, blood red ruby. So that day I saw with my own eyes the reality of the scripture in Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Don't lay up treasures on this earth, but lay up treasures in heaven. How can you lay up treasures in heaven? When you give your money away. When you give your money to the poor. When you give your money to the works of God. It's, it's a sacrifice that you are making. And that sacrifice that you make is translated as a precious stone up in heaven. Amen. So don't hoard up wealth for yourselves. You know, God has begun to shake the Southeast Asian nations. This is the word that came to me two years ago. He has shaken the nations, Southeast Asian nations. All these tragedies that you hear taking place in the Southeast Asian nations, 
they are not just tragedies god is shaking them the goldenness especially he shakes the goldenness whatever there is goldenness for singapore or for malaysia or for thailand or for indonesia he is shaking them so don't put your trust in them finally hold your peace before god zephaniah chapter 1 verse 7 The Lord is in his temple let all flesh be quiet wait before him if you read Exodus 24 verses 12 to 18 God called Moses to wait before him on the mount he said come come and wait i want to talk with you so Moses went up on the mount he was waiting one hour passed by Two hour pass by, three hour pass by. If God had told that to you, what would you have done? Five minutes, ayo, so late ah. <laughs> Aya, so late ready. I have no time ma. Ah. And you will start walking away. Or we'll take our iPad. Let's kill the time. Play some games. <laughs> One day pass by. God didn't show up. Two days, three days, four days, five days, six days, for six full days and full night, Moses was waiting for God on the mount. Because God said, "Come and wait." He did not say, "Come and wait and see." If I didn't show up, you can go back home. He didn't say that. He said, "Come and wait." and he waited 6 days and on the 7th day god spoke to him for 6 days god waited to see whether moses will wait whether you have the patience to wait it's not just waiting you know god is renewing you refining you purifying you transforming you changing you to see his glory some things that sometimes we ask for we ask for two big things say i want to see your face lord i want to hear your face i mean i want to hear your voice we all have those desires good desires but our soul is so corrupted so decayed you cannot immediately see even when the lord is standing right before your face so first you need to clean be clean of all the decays it takes time the problem is not with god the problem is with us it's because of all the corruption in your heart all the layers of flesh fat in the heart that prevents you from seeing god i'm sure you all have at pork fat it is very very thick no at least 3 or 4 inches thick that much of layer of fat flesh is on our heart so it needs to be burned the layers needs to be burned so when you wait on god the fires come to burn it burns it burns and burns and the burning is relative to how much you yield how much you are willing to let go if you're not willing to let go you're not willing to yield then the fire will be stopped because you have put a block lord you can have anything in my life except this there are some compartments where we hide things and we say god you have no access there i'm sure you have said like that and until you open that closet and allow god to enter in completely then you are not going to get what you want to get either you surrender 100% or you don't surrender no such thing as 99.9% surrender it's 100% or nothing the lord jesus said take up my cross and follow me it's a cross 
And the cross demands sacrifice. It's not easy. But if you're not willing to pay the price, then can, can, can carry plastic cross. That so many of us carry today. And we pride ourselves that we are carrying the cross. In reality, it is a plastic cross that is weightless. The cross of Christ is weighty. And it demands a sacrifice. A sacrifice even your life. Are you willing? If you are not willing, then we are playing church. You know, when I was a new believer, our pastor, a very wonderful, prayerful man, for our new believers class, he recommended all of us to read a book called The Cause of Discipleship. He said, highly recommended for new believers. So in my zeal, I went and bought that book. It's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and a martyr for God. And the theme of the book is, when Christ calls a person, come, he calls him to come and die. That is the opening sentence of the book. When Christ calls a person, come, it means come and die. If you are not willing to die, then don't come. That's the cross. If any man wants to follow me, let him take up his cross and follow after me. Today there are so many believers who are after the Lord for the fishes and the loaves of bread. That's all. You know, when the Lord multiplied fishes and loaves, He had a huge following. Huge following. Mega church. I was shocked one day when I read the scripture where, it's, where the Lord turned around. He looked at the crowd and said, Why are you following me? Is it for the loaves and the fishes that I fed you? Any minister today would be so happy to have a mega church. Right? In today's culture. But look at the Lord Jesus. He turned around and he rebuked them. He said, Why are you following me? Is it because of material gain? Is it for prosperity? Why? The moment he said that, out of 500, his church membership dropped to 70. One sentence, boom, it dropped to 70. And then he looked at the 17 and said, He who comes after me, if he does not forsake father, mother, wife, children, lands, houses, for my sake, he is not worthy of me. 70 drop to 12. <laughs> what a, what a bad pastor the Lord must have been. And then, the 12 kept on following him. Out of the 12, only 3 seems to be the closest to him. And out of the 3, only 1 was willing to pay the ultimate price till the end. Even the 3, you know, they were nowhere to be found when the Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross. Only John was there. Till the end, only one disciple, now look at the numbers, from a multitude of 20,000 on the Mount of Beatitudes, it shrunk to 500, from 500 it shrunk to 70, 70 to 12, 12 to 1. One was the only one that remained till the end. Are you that one? Or are you that one among the 20,000 who go to church, who follow the Lord because you want some material gain? Why are you here? 
running after prophetic word is also a material gain so if there's no prophetic word being spoken today you wouldn't have come i told our pastor condition you know i said okay i'll come to your church on one condition i will not minister personally or give prophetic word to anybody i said do you agree he said i agree i came on that one condition when god is speaking to you directly why do you need second hand sources from right that is kindergarten christianity you are no more babes you should go on to perfection right you should go on perfection when the lord can speak to you directly amen